Chapter 4. The Food Question. Objections to paraffin oil as an atmosphere. Advantages of cheese as a traveling companion. A married woman deserts her home. Further provision for getting upset. I pack. Cussedness of toothbrushes. George and Harris pack. Awful behavior of Montmorency. We retire to rest. Then we discussed the food question. George said, begin with breakfast. George is so practical. Now for breakfast, we shall want a frying pan. Harris said it was indigestible, but we merely urged him not to be an ass, and George went on. A teapot and a kettle, and a methylated spirit stove. No oil, said George, with a significant look, and Harris and I agreed. We had taken up an oil stove once, but never again. It had been like living in an oil shop that week. It oozed. I never saw such a thing as paraffin oil is to ooze. We kept it in the nose of the boat, and from there it oozed down to the rudder, impregnating the whole boat and everything in it on its way. And it oozed over the river and saturated the scenery and spoilt the atmosphere. Sometimes a westerly oily wind blew, and at other times an easterly oily wind. And sometimes it blew a northerly oily wind, and maybe a southerly oily wind. But whether it came from the arctic snows or was raised in the waste of the desert sands, it came alike to us laden with the fragrance of paraffin oil. And that oil oozed up and ruined the sunset and is for the moonbeams, they positively reeked of paraffin. We tried to get away from it at Marlow. We left the boat by the bridge and took a walk through the town to escape it, but it followed us. The whole town was full of oil. We passed through the churchyard, and it seemed as if the people had been buried in oil. The high street stunk of oil. We wondered how people could live in it. And we walked miles upon miles out Birmingham Way, but it was no use. The country was steeped in oil. At the end of that trip, we met together at midnight in a lonely field under a blasted oak and took an awful oath. We had been swearing for a whole week about the thing in an ordinary middle-class way, but this was a swell affair. An awful oath never to take paraffin oil with us in a boat again, except, of course, in case of sickness. Therefore, in the present instance, we confined ourselves to methylated spirit. Even that is bad enough. You get methylated pie and methylated cake, but methylated spirit is more wholesome when taken into the system in large quantities than paraffin oil. For other breakfast things, George suggested eggs and bacon, which were easy to cook, cold meat, tea, bread and butter, and jam. For lunch, he said, we could have biscuits, cold meat, bread and butter, and jam, but no cheese. Cheese, like oil, makes too much of itself. It wants the whole boat to itself. It goes through the hamper and gives a cheesy flavor to everything else there. You can't tell whether you're eating apple pie or German sausage or strawberries and cream. It all seems cheese. There's too much odor about cheese. I remember a friend of mine buying a couple of cheeses at Liverpool. Splendid cheeses they were, ripe and mellow and with a 200 horsepower scent about them that might have been warranted to carry three miles and knock a man over at 200 yards. I was in Liverpool at the time and my friend said that if I didn't mind, he would get me to take them back with me to London as he should not be coming up for a day or two himself and he did not think the cheeses ought to be kept much longer. Oh, with pleasure, dear boy, I replied. Such pleasure. With pleasure. I'm sorry. I called for the cheeses. Oh, gosh, lost my page. And took them away in a cab. It was a ramshackle affair, dragged along by a knock-kneed, brown-winded sonambulance, which his owner, in a moment of enthusiasm during conversation, referred to as a horse. I put the cheeses on the top. And we started off at a shamble that would have done credit to the swiftest steamroller ever built, and all went merry as a funeral bell until we turned the corner. There the wind carried a whiff from the cheeses full on to our steed. It woke him up, 
and with a snort of terror, he dashed off at three miles an hour. The wind still blew in his direction, and before we reached the end of the street, he was laying himself out at the rate of nearly four miles an hour, leaving the cripples and stout old ladies simply nowhere. It took two porters, as well as the driver, to hold him in at the station, and I do not think they would have done it even then had not one of the men had the presence of mind to put a handkerchief over his nose and to light a bit of brown paper. I took my ticket and marched proudly up the platform with my cheeses, the people falling back respectfully on either side. The train was crowded and I had to get into a carriage where there were already seven other people. One crusty old gentleman objected, but I got in notwithstanding and, putting my cheeses upon the rack, squeezed down with a pleasant smile and said it was a warm day. A few moments passed and then the old gentleman began to fidget. Very close in here, he said. Quite impressive, said the man next to him. And then they both began sniffing. And at the third sniff, they caught it right on the chest and rose up without another word and went out. And then a stout lady got up and said it was disgraceful that a respectable married woman should be harried about in this way and gathered up a bag and ate parcels and went. The remaining four passengers sat on for a while until a solemn looking man in the corner who from his dress was a gen and general appearance seemed to belong to the undertaker class said it put him in mind of a dead baby and the other three passengers tried to get out of the door at the same time and hurt themselves. I smiled at the black gentleman and said I thought we were going to have the carriage to ourselves and he laughed pleasantly and said that some people made such a fuss over a little thing but even he grew strangely depressed after we had started and so when we reached crew I asked him to come and have a drink. He accepted and we forced our way into the buffet where we yelled and stamped and waved our umbrellas for a quarter of an hour and then the young lady came and asked us if we wanted anything. What's yours? I said, turning to my friend. All the half crowns were the brandy neat, if you please, miss, he responded. And he went off quietly after he had drunk it and got into another carriage, which I thought mean. From crew, I had the compartment to myself, though the train was crowded. As we drew up at the different stations, the people, seeing my empty car carriage, would rush for it. Here you are, Maria, come along, plenty of room. All right, Tom, we'll get in here, they would shout. And they would run along, carrying heavy bags, and fight round the door to get in first. And one would open the door and mount the steps and stagger back into the arms of the man behind him. And they would all come and have a sniff and then droop off and squeeze into other carriages or pay the difference and go first. From Houston, I took the cheeses down to my friend's house. When his wife came into the room, she smelt round for an instance. Then she said, What is it? Tell me the worst. I said, it's cheeses. Tom brought them in Liverpool and asked me to bring them up with me. And I added that I hope she understood that it had nothing to do with me. And she said that she was sure of that, but that she would speak to Tom about it when he came back. My friend was detained in Liverpool longer than he expected. And three days later, as he hadn't returned home, his wife called on me. She said, what did Tom say about those cheeses? I replied that he had directed they were to be kept in a moist place and nobody was to touch them. She said, nobody's likely to touch them. Has he smelt them? I thought he had and added that he seemed greatly attached to them. You think he would be upset, she queried, if I gave a man a sovereign to take them away and bury them? I answered that I thought he would never smile again. An idea struck her. She said, do you mind keeping them for me? Let me send them round to you. Madam, I replied. For myself, I like the smell of cheese and the journey the other day with them from Liverpool I shall ever look back upon as a happy ending to a pleasant holiday. But in this world, we must consider others. The lady under whose roof I have the honor of residing is a widow and for all I know, possibly an orphan too. She has a strong, I may say, an eloquent objection to being what she terms put upon. The presence of your husband's cheeses in her house, she would, I instinctively feel, regard as a put upon. And it shall never be said that I put upon the widow and the orphan. Very well, then, 
said my friend's wife, rising. All I have to say is that I shall take the children and go to an hotel until those cheeses are eaten. I decline to live any longer in the same house with them. She kept her word, leaving the place in charge of the charwoman, who, when asked if she could stand the smell, replied, What smell? And who, when taken close to the cheeses and told to sniff hard, said she could detect a faint odor of melons. It was argued from this that little injury could result to the woman from the atmosphere, and she was left. The hotel bill came to 15 guineas, and my friend, after reckoning everything up, found that the cheeses had caught him, the cheeses had cost him 18 and sixpence a pound. Excuse me, eight and sixpence a pound. He said he dearly loved a bit of cheese, but it was beyond his means, so he determined to get rid of them. He threw them into the canal, but he had to fish them out again, as the bargemen complained. They said it made them feel quite faint, and after that he took them one dark night and left them in the parish mortuary. But the coroner discovered them and made a fearful fuss. He said it was a plot to deprive him of his living by waking up the corpses. My friend got rid of them at last by taking them down to a seaside town and burying them on the beach. It gained the place quite a reputation. Visitors said they had never noticed before how strong the air was, and weak-chested and consumptive people used to throng there for years afterwards. Fond as I am of cheese, therefore, I hold that George was right in declining to take any. We shan't want any, said George. Harris's face fell at this. But we'll have a good round, square, slap-up meal at seven, dinner, tea, and supper combined. Harris grew more cheerful. George suggested meat and fruit pies, cold meat, tomatoes, fruit, and green stuff. For drink, we took some wonderful sticky concoction of Harris's, which you mixed with water and called lemonade. Plenty of tea and a bottle of whiskey, in case, as George said, we got upset. It seemed to me that George harped too much on the getting upset idea. It seemed to me the wrong spirit to go about the trip in. But I'm, excuse me, but I'm glad we took the whiskey. We didn't take beer or wine. They are a mistake up the river. They make you feel sleepy and heavy. A glass in the evening, when you're doing a mooch around the town and looking at the girls is all right enough. But don't drink when the sun is blazing down on your head and you've got hard work to do. We made a list of the things to be taken and a pretty lengthy one it was before we parted that evening. The next day, which was Friday, we got them all together and met in the evening to pack. We got a big gladstone for the clothes and a couple of hampers for the victuals and the cooking utensils. We moved the table up against the window, piled everything in a heap in the middle of the floor, and sat round and looked at it. I said I'd pack. I rather pride myself on my packing. Packing is one of those many things that I feel I know more about than any other person living. It surprises me myself sometimes how many of these subjects there are. I impressed the fact upon George and Harris and told them that they had better leave the whole matter entirely to me. They fell into the suggestion with a readiness that had something uncanny about it. George put on a pipe and spread himself over the easy chair and Harris cocked his legs on the table and lit a cigar. This was hardly what I intended. What I had meant, of course, was that I should boss the job, and that Harris and George should potter about under my directions. I pushing them aside every now and then with a, oh, you here, let me do it. There you are, simple enough. Really teaching them, as you might say. Their taking it in the way they did irritated me. There's nothing does irritate me more than seeing other people sitting about doing nothing when I'm working. I lived with a man once who used to make me mad that way. He would loll on the sofa and watch me doing things by the hour together, following me round the room with his eyes wherever I went. He said it did him real good to look on at me, messing about. He said it made him feel that life was not an idle dream to be get, gaped and yawned through, but a noble task full of dusty duty and stone, stern work. He said he often wondered now how he could have gone on before he met me, never having anybody to look at while they worked.
Now, I'm not like that. I can't sit still and see another man slaving and working. I want to get up and superintend and walk round with my hands in my pockets and tell him what to do. It is my energetic nature. I can't help it. However, I did not say anything but started the packing. It seemed a longer job than I had thought it was going to be, but I got the bag finished at last and I sat on it and strapped it. Ain't you going to put the boots in? said Harris. And I looked round and found I had forgotten them. That's just like Harris. He couldn't have said a word until I'd got the bag shut and strapped, of course. And George laughed, one of those irritating, scentless, senseless, chuckle-headed, crack-jawed laughed of his. They do make me so wild. I opened the bag and packed the boots in, and then, just as I was going to close it, a horrible idea occurred to me. Had I packed my toothbrush? I don't know how it is, but I never do know whether I've packed my toothbrush. My toothbrush is a thing that haunts me when I'm traveling and makes my life a misery. I dream that I haven't packed it and wake up in a cold perspiration and get out of bed and hunt for it. And in the morning, I pack it before I have used it and have to unpack it to get again to get it. And it is always the last thing I turn out of the bag. And then I repack and forget it and have to rush upstairs for it at the last moment and carry it to the railway station wrapped up in my pocket handkerchief. Of course, I had to turn every mortal thing out now. And of course, I could not find it. I rummaged the things up into much the same state that they must have been before the world was created. And when chaos reigned, of course, I found George's and Harris's 18 times over, but I couldn't find my own. I put the things back one by one and held everything up and shook it. Then I found it inside a boot. I repacked once more. When I had finished, George asked if the soap was in. I said I didn't care a hang whether the soap was in or whether it wasn't. I slammed the bag to and strapped it and found that I had packed my tobacco pouch in it and had to reopen it. It got shut up finally at 10.05 p.m. and then there remained the hampers to do. Harris said that we should be wanting to start in less than 12 hours time and thought that he and George had better do the rest and I agreed and sat down and they had to go. They began in a light-hearted spirit, evidently intending to show me how to do it. I made no comment, I only waited. When George is hanged, Harris will be the worst packer in this world, and I looked at the piles of plates and cups and kettles and bottles and jars and pies and stoves and cakes and tomatoes, etc., and felt that the thing would soon become exciting. It did. They started with breaking a cup. That was the first thing they did. They did that just to show you what they could do and get you interested. Then Harris packed the strawberry jam on top of a tomato and squashed it, and they had to pick out the tomato with a teaspoon. And then it was George's turn, and he trod on the butter. I didn't say anything, but I came over and sat on the edge of the table and watched them. It irritated them more than anything I could have said. I felt that. It made them nervous and excited, and they stepped on things and put things behind them, and then couldn't find them when they wanted them. And they packed the pies at the bottom and put heavy things on top and smashed the pies in. They upset Saul over everything, and as for the butter, I never saw two men more, do more with one and two pence worth of butter in my whole life than they did. After George had got it off his slipper, they tried to put it in the kettle. It wouldn't go in, and what was in wouldn't come out. They did scrape it out at last and put it down on a chair, and Harris sat on it, and it stuck to him, and they went looking for it all over the room. I'll take my oath I put it down on that chair, said George, staring at the empty seat. I saw you do it myself not a minute ago, said Harris. Then they started round the room again looking for it, and then they met again in the center and stared at one another. Most extraordinary thing I ever heard of, said George. So mysterious, said Harris. Then George got round the back of Harris and saw it. Why, here it is the whole time, he exclaimed indignantly. Where? cried Harris, spinning around. Oh, I got the voices mixed up. Stand, stand still, can't you? roared George, flying after him. And they got it off and packed it in the teapot. Montmorency was in it all, of course. Montmorency's ambition in life is to get in the way and be sworn at. 
If he can squirm in anywhere where he particularly is not wanted and be a perfect nuisance and make people mad and have things thrown in his head, then he feels his day has not been wasted. To get somebody to stumble over him and curse him steadily for an hour is his highest aim and object, and when he has succeeded in accomplishing this, his conceit becomes quite unbearable. He came down on things just when they were wanted to be packed, and he labored under the fixed belief that whenever Harris or George reached out their hand for anything, it was his cold, damp nose they wanted. He put his leg into the jam and he worried the teaspoons and he pretended that the lemons were rats and got into the hamper and killed three of them before Harris could land him with the frying pan. Harris said I encouraged him. I didn't encourage him. A dog like that doesn't want any encouragement. It's a natural original sin that is born in him that makes him do things like that. The packing was done at 12.50 and Harris sat on the big hamper and said he hoped nothing would be found broken. George said that if anything was broken, Broken, it was broken, which reflection seemed to comfort him. He also said he was ready for bed. We were all ready for bed. Harris was to sleep with us that night, and we went upstairs. We tossed for beds, and Harris had to sleep with me. He said, do you prefer the inside or the outside, Jay? I said I generally preferred to sleep inside a bed. Harris said it was old. George said, what time shall I wake you fellows? Harris said, seven. I said, no, six, because I wanted to write some letters. Harris and I had a bit of a row over it, but at last split the difference and said half past six. Wake us up at 6.30, George, we said. George made no answer, and we found on going over that he had been asleep for some time, so we placed the path where he could tumble into it on getting out in the morning and went to bed ourselves. <laughs>